and the masters of the universe. I am Adam, Prince of Eternia and defender of the secrets of Castle Grayskull. This is Cringer, my fearless friend. Fabulous secret powers were revealed to me the day I held aloft my magic sword and said, By the power of Grayskull! became the mighty battle cat and I became He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe. Welcome. <laughs> Being born in 1976, I am a product of the 1980s. It's when I had my teenage years and if you go to my office at home, my office is full of vintage Lego Technic, Transformers, He-Man, Mask, all of that stuff. I love collecting it. And I think great things uh, started in the 1980s, and it was also in the 1980s that uh, Navision uh, got started. And it was also in the 1980s, 1990s that we got uh, Seaside, and we started hacking away in, uh, in Seaside. What I want to do today, together with uh, Pike, is uh, we're going to uh, take you through uh, some of our own experiences the last year in uh, migrating uh, customers to extensions, the things that worked, the things that failed. And uh, I want you to uh, change from uh, Gringer into the Battle Cat. And let's see if we can find your magic sword and that hopefully after the session you can say, I have the power and I can move to VS Code and I can uh, write uh, proper clean code. So my name is Mark, and I've been doing the vision for as long as I remember, uh, more than uh, uh, 20 years. And actually, the last 12 months of my life, I skulked, and I said, OK, uh, I'm not going to talk about design patterns. I'm not going to teach anymore. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go to customers. I'm going to go and work with an ISV, and I'm going to make extensions and see how that actually worked. And uh, that works really uh, nice because uh, a year ago also my wife said, we are pregnant again, so you have to stay home, right? So uh, Murphy was nice to me for a change. So that's me. Now the floor is to Pike. Introduce yourself and then take us through the agenda. Uh, yes, I will. Hello, my name is Pike Peg Anderson. Um, when Mark was six years old, <laughs> Uh, I participated in the beta test of the first version of NAV, which was not called NAV. It wasn't even called Navigator. It was called PC+. Uh, ever since that, uh, I have destroyed solutions around the world. Uh, and now I do have uh, uh, customer, end user customers and uh, have uh, teaching. Uh, what we're going to do here is uh, we're going to uh, go through a couple of the examples. Uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, start out by uh, how to prepare for the upgrade. What I did last year was I decided to become a front runner. And a front runner uh, is always uh, hard because you get all the problems that there is. Uh, and um, of course, uh, at some point it gets better and better. And of course, it helped with the CUs that kept coming. Uh, so it got easier at the end. So. First the thing uh, that we, we, uh, we saw, all right, we need to discuss, do we need to go to, to on-premise, do we need to go to the cloud? And there are pros and cons on both of them. Uh, so most of our customers have, have already an on-premise on solution. Uh, and therefore, it's, uh, it's usually the customer that says, all right, we want to stay on-premise uh, unless there's some, some uh, other uh, reasons for, for, for going to the cloud. Uh, then we need to decide, do we want to move all our extensions or do we want to go hybrid? Well, there's a lot of discussions about should it be a hybrid solution or should we go 100%. Uh, sometimes it's not uh, uh, possible to go 100% to extensions. So uh, therefore, sometimes you have to go this way. Now, <coughs> the .NET uh, support came in, uh, in uh, CU, uh, what, 4 or something like that. Uh, and... Um, 
Uh, therefore, CU, the, the .NET uh, in extension wasn't possible before that. Now, uh, still not every .NET that is possible in, uh, in, uh, uh, in extensions, but then you can uh, utilize the uh, Azure functions or, uh, or uh, yeah, uh, use some of the new functionality that has been, been built into the, uh, to the AL editor. Uh, so now we also have to discuss, do we want to go uh, the whole way from the beginning? Meaning, do we want to take all our uh, changes and make it into an extension? Uh, or uh, do we want to go one-to-one uh, -one conversion from, uh, from our uh, customized solution uh, up to a new customized solution on a business central uh, and then slowly take the, uh, the customizations and move it into extension one by one. Now that's not always possible because, I mean, there might be some uh, dependencies. You might, whenever you move a table, then you also have to move all the relevant pages and reports and, uh, and all that. So, but you can take chumps, uh, chunks of the, the different uh, uh, customizations and move them uh, one by one. Also, one of the uh, issues that we saw is uh, we didn't have all the localizations available uh, and we didn't uh, also not have uh, the, the uh, uh, add-ons that we needed. Now, <coughs> also when you uh, look at uh, the, uh, the cloud solution, we need to see which uh, apps do we have available and are there apps that actually can substitute some of the customizations that we have made previously. Now, there's a lot of different uh, uh, parties involved in a NAV solution. First of all, we, we have our, uh, our uh, W1 version, uh, then you have uh, the Microsoft built-in extensions um, you might have some localizations that comes on top of this, and they can also be hybrid. The Danish solution right now is uh, consists of, uh, of four extensions, but there are still some code directly in uh, the base application. Uh, then you have the add-ons, uh, and do the, uh, the add-ons function as a, an extension, or uh, is it still in, in, uh, installed in the base application? And then you have apps on top of that, and then the red one up here is the user customization, because that's also possible. So all of these things are uh, a part of the solution that we need to, to handle later on. Now, when we prepared for this, the first thing that we need to do was we need to uh, do the actual conversion. Uh, and the actual conversion, uh, actually, uh, we found out that that took a lot longer than we expected. Normally, you would just uh, take your, your new development environment, you will click on to the database and it says, do you want to upgrade? Yeah, I want to upgrade and that's it. That, it wasn't like that, let me just say that. First of all, we need to, uh, to have a, a, a database as a single user, we need to have uh, our license file updated to, to uh, Dynamics 365 BC. Um, we couldn't have any locked objects, uh, we could not have objects not included in the license file so that means that uh, lazy ISVs who has uh, discontinued some uh, some objects and they are still in the object package but they are not in the in the license no can do uh, also whatever you have of uh, your own small testing objects out um, what we also found out that if you have uh, reminiscence of other localizations we had the situations where we we had uh, multiple countries where we had put uh, localizations from one to the other, that wasn't possible either. So we needed to remove the localizations that didn't, uh, didn't uh, work. Um, and so some strange stuff, uh, debugger breakpoints, you cannot have any records in there. Uh, and you cannot have any records in the, in the, the server instance table. Um, but the worst part was actually that uh, we needed to have a developer's license uh, that covered all of the, the uh, add-ons and the localizations. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in some cases we did, we did have it, and in some cases we didn't. We tried to use the, the uh, customer license to, uh, to convert, uh, but then we found out that uh, at the end, after half an hour, thank you very much, then it came out and said that it needed uh, access to 
uh, to modify the GL entry table. Yikes. So therefore, we needed a developer's license. Um, and um, the next thing was the, we need to go through all the different steps. So we, if we have a 2009, then we need to go first to 2013 to do the first conversion. We need to go from the 13 to 15. And I, there was actually a version, wasn't there, uh, of, uh, of NAV where you could convert directly from 2013 R2, as far as I remember, directly up to 2018. But you cannot do that anymore. Uh, so this is uh, the, the steps that you need to take. Now, if this had been a cloud solution, uh, the only way to do it was uh, to go through rapid start. Now, if any of you have tried to, to uh, go to search for rapid start in the, in the cloud solution, it says it doesn't, it doesn't exist. But it does exist. It's there somewhere, but the functions are there. You just need to, uh, to, to call the configuration packages or whatever. Now, this is not my own uh, experience, but one of my, uh, my partners that I'm working with, uh, they had a, a one terabyte 2009 database and they did a test conversion just from 2009 to 2013. And uh, just uh, all the dimension uh, conversion, it took one week. Great. Also, another thing, when you start doing extensions, you need to have a prefix or a suffix. And every partner can apply to have a, a prefix or a suffix. And it's a minimum three letter suffix or prefix, maybe some of you have heard it before, maybe some of you have not heard it before. And um, uh, the three letter, they will be quickly gone, so you need to be uh, quite fast. I mean, my company name is this Big Anderson Consult. If I had to prefix every object with that, an object can maximum be t uh, 30 characters, and then I would have 11 characters left uh, to, um, uh, to, to uh, give uh, my object a name. So. Um, Therefore, apply now, uh, and uh, in s on some of the courses I have in, uh, in extension, uh, uh, in uh, building extensions, uh, some of my delegates have actually applied during the course and got the answer uh, during the course. Um, I applied for these until I actually looked at the middle one and thought, no, 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 I'm not taking the bacon one. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I, I uh, but. I got mine, so you just need to be fast. If you want uh, a, a, a prefix that is actually writable and uh, that says something about your, uh, your company. Now the big question we have here is, uh, do we want to make one large extension for each customer? Or do we want to make multiple extensions with dependencies? Uh, or we could make multiple extensions without uh, dependencies. Okay, the dependencies, uh, well, if we, for example, have the Danish version, the Danish localization consists of four extensions. If I want to utilize some of the fields there are in the, for example, if I want to make a, an, a sales invoice with an FIK number, which is something Danish, uh, then you actually need to, uh, to make an extension. So, uh, Therefore, you cannot get around the dependencies. Uh, but let me just tell you that these dependencies is something that you'd need to be really, really careful about because that can uh, make a total chaos. Um, as you can see, we have a number of different elements built into uh, our solution in the future. Uh, and um, whenever we build a, a solution, uh, an extension that uh, we make for ourselves, then uh, it will be dependent on maybe the add-ons that we have on the solution, maybe the localization. Uh, and um, all of these dependencies uh, are going to make a kind of a spaghetti network so that you cannot move or remove an underlying uh, extension uh, before you have removed all the other extensions. So I'm not going to say that I actually uh, melted down a database yesterday, am I? No. I'm so, good. Also, uh, when we want to uh, make a development environment, because we might want to have a testing environment or develop a development environment uh, for, for uh, our customers, 
Uh, well, in, uh, in on-premise, it's easy. I mean, we go and we make a SQL Server backup. Uh, now, we, as we saw in the keynote, in the cloud, it's even easier. It's just going into the partner center and then just click uh, on the uh, create a sandbox, and then you will get a, a exact copy. Uh, good. Mark? switch. So one of the companies that I work for is a company called 4NAV. Uh, you probably heard of it. Uh, we've been uh, a platinum sponsor of NAV Tech Days for quite a few years now and uh, with 4NAV we started our journey to uh, app source and to extensions in the last uh, 12 to 18 uh, months. And I just want to share a couple of things that we ran into during that process. And I also want to share, I want to give you a couple of gifts, right? Um, we ran into some problems. Uh, we solved the problems and I'm going to share my experiences, but we're also going to share the tools that we use to, uh, to fix it. Um, as Spike said, one of the first things that you need to do before uh, starting on the whole app source uh, journey is you have to uh, register for a prefix. Uh, the prefix or the suffix is uh, a workaround for the problem that we still have IDs in the, uh, in the objects. Uh, eventually, uh, I've been told by Microsoft that the IDs will go away. Uh, but before the IDs go away, uh, a lot of stuff needs to, uh, to happen. And the only way that Microsoft can guarantee that if you run multiple extensions in AppSource that they don't crash is that everybody actually uh, suffixes or prefixes the, um, uh, the object. So not a big surprise, uh, we reserved uh, four, um, which makes our lives a lot easier. Um, we cheated a little bit because the life cycle of our product only started uh, two, three years ago. Uh, so when I started working on this solution, I already knew a lot of stuff that was going on. Uh, but we actually also prefixed everything in Seaside, right? You can actually already do a lot of stuff in Seaside before uh, you actually think about going into the uh, app source journey. In app source, everything is about uh, simplicity. Uh, everything has to work intuitively and basically what a customer can do in an app source is they can create a sandbox based on their live database and in that sandbox they can deploy your extension and they can start playing around with it. So as an ISV you are no longer in charge of installing the software. It's no longer that you make an appointment of a consultant and the consultant shows up with a briefcase and the briefcase he opens it up and he puts a diskette and he has the FOP and the license file, but the customer is actually going to do that experience themselves. So what we did in, uh, in Seaside is um, uh, we added notifications. So um, if you install the extension or the FOP, uh, the first time you run the software, it actually checks if the setup table is populated. If the setup table is empty, it will give you a notification. It said, okay, well, you installed the 4NAV product. Do you want to set it up? And as soon as you click uh, yes, I mean, you can click no, you can actually say, I don't want to see it again. But then it starts a wizard. And the wizard uh, is kind of, uh, the wizard used to be dead, right? Uh, in the classic client, making wizards was very hard. You had to make this form and uh, you had to move all of the expos and the expos and the stuff overlapping each other. But with uh, app source, wizards are now back and um, uh, wizards are meant for your customers to be able to install your extension uh, pretty quickly. Um, and you can add those wizards in AL, but you can also do it in, uh, in Seaside. Um, another thing which is um, uh, mandatory is uh, translations. Um, I'll show you in a minute that uh, if you create an extension, uh, if you go to X app source, you have to create these XLIF files. Uh, somebody here loves XLEF files, raise your hand if you love them. Uh, there's the door. <laughs> Please leave the room. 
No, they solve a problem. Uh, they solve a problem that we had. I mean, it's not nice to have translations in your objects, but come on, guys, give us a better solution than this. Um, and tooltips. Tooltips are not mandatory. Um, it's not mandatory to have tooltips in uh, App Source, but it is highly recommended. And uh, as you saw in the keynotes this morning, uh, even the search is optimized to show a tooltip, right? If you search for something and the search finds an action with a tooltip, the search will show the tooltip and it will make support of your extension a lot easier if customers don't have to pick up the phone and call you or actually throw your extension away because they don't understand how to, uh, how to use it. Another thing is uh, writing tests. Um, if you want to go on AppSource, uh, you need to have 90% test coverage. It is actually very easy to get 90% test coverage, right? It's what you do with the results. I mean, I can run all my code and I'll have 100% test coverage. Uh, so I'm not really sure how serious this is um, uh, if they actually look at the results. But you can already start writing tests in, um, in Seaside. And if you create your extension, you can create a second extension with your uh, tests. Your second extension will take a dependency on the first extension. And then if you publish it, you can run the tests using the, um, the test tool page. And of course, um, write clean code, right? Um, if you started five years ago or 10 years ago with creating uh, your own code units, your own uh, hooks, um, if you've been nice to NAV in the last five or 10 years, then your journey to extensions will be a lot easier. Um, in the second demo that I'm going to show you is uh, I'm going to show you an extension with 2000 objects and it actually works, right? Um, one of the challenges that we have, uh, that we run into, is that um, as an ISV solution, we have to span across multiple versions. Um, with 4Nav, we go back to 2013, 2013 R2. Um, and I don't want to create FOPs for each Seaside version and uh, extensions for each uh, Business Central version. Um, so this is basically what we do. We code everything in Business Central, in Seaside in Business Central, and then we downgrade and upgrade, right? And we have one code base uh, that we work from. Um, I hope this is big enough. I always have a hard time figuring out here at NAV Tech Days how small you can make the font uh, before people start complaining that they can't read it anymore. So the development process looks like this. We start in, uh, in Seaside, uh, where we have the, uh, the report pack, and we have all the tools that we have. This is where we have the, the test. And in Seaside, I use a very simple trick. Um, the good thing about extensions is extensions force you to think about decoupling, and I'll get back to that in the second demo. But in Seaside, you can also decouple, right? Um, and what I do is I use the version list to decouple. Um, I have different tags in my version list, and by filtering on the version list, I know that I get a subset of objects, and that subset of objects does not have overlap with anything else. So that subset of objects can be an extension by itself, right? That's how I separate my, my test and my ship and, and some of my development tools. So then we go to um, uh, Seaside, uh, from Seaside to Seaside. That might sound a bit strange, but we actually do some cleaning up before we, uh, before we ship. And then my colleague, uh, Jacob, he wrote a couple of uh, uh, C-sharp um, lines of code with regular expressions. And basically what he did is, um, if we want to deploy our report pack uh, to NAV20, when did notifications come in? Was it 17 or 16? Right, 17. So in 2016, you cannot have notifications, right? So what Jacob's tool is doing, is um, if somebody wants to use our report pack in NAV 2016, we actually uh, delete the code units that have the notification. That, of course, means that your notifications have to be isolated, right? If you raise a notification inside of an object that you need, then you cannot just automatically remove that notification if you want to downgrade, right? Then we go to Business Central. Um, and I'll show you in a, in a minute uh, how we do that. But we basically create an extension uh, from the Seaside objects. 
and we have two flavors. Uh, we have a flavor with uh, .NET. Uh, those of you who have experience with our tool, you know that we depend on a .NET DLL that resides in the service tier folder. And we decided for now that if we want to run on-prem, we're going to keep on running on those DLLs. In AppSource, we have um, uh, a service which is running on, uh, on Azure. We don't use Azure Functions. Uh, Jakob in our team is the guy who is doing Azure. And Jakob found out that if you want to do GDI manipulation, which you need for PDF crunching, that Azure Function actually blows up. So he is using uh, Azure Service Connections or something like that, and that actually worked, uh, worked for us. Um, but of course, if you want to run on, uh, on Azure, you have, to, uh, you have to pay. If you want to go with, uh, with Business Central, you have to come up with a new way of, uh, of charging your customers, because now we are in a situation that if a customer runs a big report, then we are actually paying the bill, right? Because all of the report crunching goes through the Azure function or the Azure service, whatever it's called. Let's call it Azure functions. Um, so that's one of the reasons why on-prem we decided to keep using uh, .NET. Um, but then we're not quite there yet, because if you want to create an extension, you need to create a couple of additional elements. Uh, one of them is uh, you need to have an installation code unit. Microsoft introduced a new type of code unit, which is called an installation code unit. Um, and it, in that installation code unit, we don't do a lot of stuff. We just, I think we publish a web service um, and um, we don't do much in the installation process because our add-on is designed for uh, simplicity. But you also need to provide an XML file with uh, permissions. Um, and we decided to use the uh, replace report functionality. So we have a chart of accounts, we have a trial balance, uh, we have a customer aging report, and we would actually like if you use Business Central and you use Fornav, that actually uh, if you click on the trial balance that actually goes into, the, uh, in, into our report. So we basically created a couple of AL files, and each time that we, uh, that we create the extension, we have to add those AL files into the uh, extension. So how, we do, how do we do that? What is the, uh, what is the magic sword that makes my life uh, easy, right? Um, for downgrades, there's a couple of things that you need to be careful with. Uh, don't use images in actions that didn't exist in older versions. Sometimes Microsoft comes up with new images and they didn't use in older versions. Put notifications in separate code units, I already talked about that. Be careful with um, properties that did not exist in older versions like uh, application area, and now we have this new GDPR uh, property that did not exist in older versions. Sometimes Microsoft does not protect you from mistakes, so you can actually read a FOB into an old version and it actually blows up because it can't find that, com uh, that property. Uh, but like I said, we use an internal tool. It's just a, a bunch of regular expressions. And if you're an ISV and you want to know how this works, just go to my colleague, Jakob. And he is the C-sharp guy in our team, and he will tell you exactly how he is yanking out all of these properties that didn't work in the, uh, in the old versions. Going up. Um, if you touch base nav, you have to create table and page delta files and event subscriber code units. I'll get back to that in the next demo because with the 4Nav extension, we don't touch uh, base objects. But then you have to run uh, TXT to AL, and this is where NAV 2018 is mandatory. Uh, you cannot uh, run TXT to AL on a 2017 or 2016 database because a requirement for the text to AL tool is that it uh, requires you to run the uh, export to new syntax. Um, and we used it in the beginning, but we, uh, we found it um, a little bit uh, hard to work with. And also, Microsoft introduced new properties, like uh, when they, they said, okay, we're going to introduce this new search feature. They introduced a new property that allows you to connect your page or your report to the search. Um, and we basically found out that um, if your page or your report was in an old menu suite, you actually can reuse the properties from the menu suite in your objects, uh, but the text to AL tool is not uh, taking care of that. So let me show you how we make that work. How is it with timing? Timing is good? Okay. 
so this is our um, extension skeleton. Uh, we have the app files, which are downloaded from uh, the, the database. Um, of course, we have the uh, .NET packages, where we have the DLL that we depend on when we run uh, on-prem. Um, and for the anything else, it's cur cur currently empty. I only have my, uh, my permission set. I can zoom up. That must be the age difference spike. So Luke, you said you wanted to have a bigger cinema, you also need bigger screens. Um, where is my converter? So here we have the converter. We already had a lot of plumbing in place because the converter uh, that we have in our product is capable of converting a classic report into our own uh, format. So we already had some, uh, some tooling available. Uh, so basically what we did is we wrapped our converter around the Microsoft tools. So the text2al exe file depends on a text2al uh, DLL file. And Michael Nielsen seems to be handy with C Sharp a little bit. So he actually reverse engineered the whole thing and he said, oh, I can do this and I can do that and look at that. And that. So we actually wrapped around the txt to al and basically what we can do is uh, we can take uh, a text export, you can go into uh, Seaside and you can filter on all of your objects which are modified and you can simply say file export and just use the normal export file. It doesn't require export to new syntax. So you can actually take an NAV 2015 database or 2016 database and export all of the customer objects to, um, uh, to a text file. And then without PowerShell or DOS or whatever, you can just uh, convert it into an extension. We have a little flag here. The flag is saying convert XLIF files. Uh, if you run with extensions on premise, you don't need XLIF files. Microsoft is still supporting the caption and uh, ML. And I think for now, until we get proper tooling around XLIF files, I think on-prem with customer-specific extensions, CaptionML is just easier, right? Uh, XLIF files is not easy to work with. Uh, it's a solution of separating captions from code, but that's about all it does. So I don't select this option, so I'm not going to generate um, XLIF files. I'm just going to run the converter and hope that the demo gods today are nice to me. And now in VS Code, the uh, objects should appear. So now we have all the objects in VS Code. The compiler starts immediately. The compiler sees that we have new files in VS Code. It gives me um, a warning. If there is anyone in the room, except Gunnar, no, you, 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 can, you can do the contest as well. But if there's anyone in the room that, uh, that knows how to get this warning out, you get a t-shirt. This warning is actually warning me that I, could, I cannot sort on the flow field. Come on, that was the best feature of NAV 2013 R2, right? Don't warn me for those great features. And now I can simply build my extension and I'm good to go. Right, so I can keep all of my daily work in Seaside. Um, I can serve all my existing customers and I can upgrade to extensions um, without having to do a lot of work. If you like PowerShell. One at the end of the yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> then come after, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve your shirt. It's not going to go away. And then you're going to tell me how to disable this warning. So this tool is free of charge. You can just download it from our website as of next week. It's not there yet, but as of next week, you can download it and uh, play around with it. Let us know uh, what you think of it. We are open for ideas. The easier we can make it for you, uh, the better. Um, and in the next demo, I'm going to show you how I'm go I use this to create an extension of more than 2,000 objects. Um, another challenge that you will 
probably run into if you start working with extensions is that you lose overview. I'm not saying Seaside is perfect, but one thing that Seaside is very nice with is that Seaside acts as an Excel sheet for us to manage our objects, right? And if you start working with extensions, you will start feeling that you're losing control of object IDs and names and what's going on in, in your system. And if you deploy an extension, uh, Microsoft does not allow you to see the objects in the object table, but Microsoft introduced a new table, and in that new table, you are, you are actually allowed to see which objects you have in the database. So Michael actually dusted off his Seaside skills, and Michael created a page that you can also download from the website. It's the Modern Object Explorer, and if you download that, uh, you get page number 1000, and um, if you get me drunk, I'll tell you how to create page number 1000. It's actually not that hard anymore. Microsoft now gives away licenses to do that, but in the past you had to hack your way around that. But this is page number 1000, so it actually runs in the customer license as well. All customers can run page number 1000. And this will show you uh, an object designer that shows all the objects from an extension. You can see if the extension is installed, you can see actually the version list of the extension, uh, and it gives you a little bit of feeling around control of the uh, objects that you, can, uh, that you can use. It's also available as an extension, so you have an extension to control extensions, and then um, it shows up in the search, and from the search you can run um, Object Designer from the web client. That's cool, right? So back to you, Mike. Back to me. Yes? So, well, when we go out to our customers, what do we do? Mostly we sell hot air, don't we? We go to them and we promise them that uh, we are going to, to uh, make their life easier and uh, they are going to, uh, to get a new system that can do everything in half the time and at half the cost, or something like that. Isn't that what the uh, salespeople usually say? Now, <coughs> we are selling changes. Now, I have a lot of partners that, uh, that I go to and, and uh, make upgrade courses for them. Uh, and I can see that um, we are not very good at, uh, at uh, adapting to changes uh, ourselves. So we would like, uh, I heard in the beginning uh, when the, the uh, Windows client came for the, for the role tailored uh, version, a lot of uh, consultants said, well, we don't like the role tailored client, could we just please have the search bar in the classic client, then we'll stay, uh, stay with that. Uh, and, um, and that's the problem. So we need to somehow uh, adapt to the changes. We need to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to get one step further. Um, the problem is that maybe people come on a course like mine and uh, learn how to, to create extensions uh, and, uh, and every, everything is fantastic, and they think, oh, this is great. And then they come back to the customer, and they are still running 360 or 370. Uh, and then you have to code in the, uh, maybe even in the native database uh, with, uh, with the, the uh, uh, previous development environment. We see that all the time. Um, but there are also some that, that embraces the changes and says, all right, we'll do that. Uh, and and uh, we want to adapt to all the new stuff and we want to go to the cloud and so on. Fine, but when we get out to the customers, uh, they are typically, they don't give a uh, about what system they are running or what v which version they are right there. The guy at the warehouse, well, he has a bar barcode scanner and he doesn't care if, uh, if uh, the system is called uh, nav or uh, 365 or whatever, whenever he uh, scans a barcode, he wanted to do some stuff and hopefully should do the same stuff at, as it did last week. Uh, <coughs> and the same with everybody else. So um, therefore, uh, when we upgrade to, to extensions, and this is not only upgrading to extensions, but upgrade uh, anything, 
we need to make the, the uh, functionality to be backwards compatible. We need to make sure that all the new functionality we, uh, we, uh, we implement is actually a setup where you can add it on and not where uh, they, they get some new stuff and say, oh, we didn't ask for this. Could you please take it away again? Um, so, um, so we need to keep the processes. We need to, to, uh, to not piss the users off. Uh, and um, now uh, one of the, now I'm not talking about pissing customers off. Uh, this is one of my customers and one the first of the experiences that, uh, that I, I had. Uh, and in this case, this was uh, a Danish production company. They have uh, production in multiple countries. Um, they, are, uh, they have an on-premise solution and they were actually having a uh, 2017 uh, uh, solution. So uh, we decided that, all right, let's, uh, let's take a look how far can we get uh, right now if we want to move it, first of all, to, to 2018. The yeah. Business Central had not come at that time. Um, we had a few add-ons that we needed to handle somehow. Uh, there was uh, some uh, document output, there was some payment management and some shop floor. Um, and the problem at the customer was that they had had multiple uh, NAV partners previously. And they had had, uh, there was a kind of spaghetti code, let's just say that. Um, so uh, we said, all right, they are, it's an on-premise solution they have. Uh, we want to start up a hybrid uh, implementation. Uh, so what we did was uh, we had uh, all the objects uh, in a one-to-one -one conversion from, uh, from the 2017 to 2018. And then we started picking and picking out uh, small extensions and we made a plan. And that plan is that we, within a year, we have moved everything uh, from uh, the, the uh, customizations in the, in, the, in the base application to extensions. Um, the problem with moving uh, our functionality is very often that we as NAV developers, we have been spoiled for so many years. Why? Because first of all, we have access to all the source code. Maybe we cannot change it, but we have access to all the source code. If somebody changes uh, the source code, we have access to that as well. Uh, so basically what we need to do now is we need to find out, first of all, if it's made as an extension, we might have to think differently. We might have to uh, make sure that, the, uh, that we cannot go into the sales line and make that change that we made in the old system. We had to make add-on functionality in some way. Uh, and um, uh, that's the one thing. Also, uh, in uh, Business Central or in NAV 2018, there might be functionality uh, where you say, all right, we can settle with the standard functionality in the new application uh, instead of using uh, the functionality that we had before. Let's say something like uh, document output. If you have a document output, well, uh, as an add-on, maybe the new solution in, uh, in NAV 2018 is enough for that. So another uh, situation we had was a, a test conversion. There was one of my customers who said, all right, we have, uh, we have 10 countries. Uh, we have um, uh, a 2013 database that has a lot an of, uh, of, uh, uh, of add-ons. We have a lot of customizations in it. Um, and um, you can see this is just uh, the list of uh, the uh, uh, add-ons that we, uh, we have in it. We have a master data replication and we have intercompany flow uh, and uh, uh, scribes, uh, scribes, ERM integration and so on, so on, so on. Uh, so this is a, a actually a massive uh, uh, task to, to upgrade. We have different databases. We have localizations from Denmark, Germany, Norway and UK that we need to handle somehow. So. Uh, our aim was to, to try to analyze what is the kind of work that will, uh, it will take to convert this. And the first thing that, uh, that we did was we said, all right, let's just convert the database. Dirt. One day later, we had just converted the database. Uh, and that was because uh, some of the limitations I told before, we have a, a developer's license that uh, was necessary because it needed to modify the GL entries. The problem was that in that database, we had uh, add-ons from German partners that was not a part of the Danish partners uh, 
uh, developer's license. And so what did we do? All right, we needed to go to the SQL server, take all the data out of the, and this was a shop floor module, take all the data out of the shop floor module, delete the objects, uh, and um, then do the conversion, and then, then uh, take all the data back into to, uh, the, um, uh, the converted solution, and uh, that was fully possible, that was not a problem. Uh, so it ended up taking a whole day just making a conversion of a database, and normally it's just click, yes, get on with it. Um, also, we had uh, objects that were left in the solution, uh, and um, there's this uh, little trick that if you, uh, if you go to the, the C side and you mark all objects uh, and you lock them, then it will only lock the objects that you actually have in your license. Uh, so therefore, you can just, uh <laughs> so you can just export those. Uh, but I mean, I it's a rea a really tedious that it, it has to be that way. So uh, problems, yeah, the add-ons were not available yet. Uh, the, um, some of the add-ons was discontinued. So uh, what shall we do then? Then we need to find an alternative solution. Can we convert from, from the uh, previous uh, solution to the next solution and so on, so on, so on. Um, discontinued add-ons, yes. Uh, only a few localizations were uh, at that moment ready for us. So, so therefore, we, we uh, decided that maybe we should just uh, wait until next year and see what happens here. Good. Then uh, I, have, uh, I also try to be a front runner in my own company. So therefore, I decided uh, to take my own company and take my own medicine and see what happens if I upgrade to the uh, to 2018, uh, I'm going to move as much as I can to extensions, uh, and um, then I'll try to make periodic upgrades. I was uh, really optimistic in the beginning. I'm thinking, all right, uh, how about if we upgrade every month? Now, no good. But um, I started with the, uh, the CU2, that was uh, the NAV 2018 CU2, which was the first version that didn't delete all my data. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> then um, uh, I moved everything to extensions, but there was something I couldn't move into extensions, and that was all my .NET. Uh, so I had to rewrite all my .NET code units, um, put it into one single code unit, rewrite it so it could be called from the extension, uh, and return with the values to uh, the uh, the extension, um, and. Um, uh, and that was more or less it. So it's a, sm a nice small solution. There's not a lot of changes, as you can see, in the numbers. Uh, so, so my p key problems here th was that, uh, first of all, the RTM to CU1 was not usable. Well, yes. Uh, .NET was not available. There was still some errors in the standard code. I mean, when I took the CU2 and installed uh, totally standard, uh, strangely enough, you couldn't post a sales order where you had an item line and a general uh, a, a geo ledger line. You couldn't uh, to post them both. So therefore, uh, I had to make some some uh, some uh, small changes in the the, the standard code. Uh, also, uh, I found out very quickly that this was a moving target I had uh, uh, maneuvered into, uh, meaning that. Uh, whenever I thought, now I found out how this works, then a new update came, and now it was not, not like that anymore. Um, so, also the uh, undocumented functionality changes in the standard code, that was, uh, no, that was not very lucky. Uh, and um, we had, uh, if in the CU3 and CU6 uh, and CU9 that I actually uh, upgraded to later on, uh, in the CU3, I think, uh, the sales line started to disappear when I uh, when I entered some data into the line. Uh, so then you had to press F5 and it came back again and you thought, oh, how did that happen? And then uh, we started getting uh, another user has changed the the, uh, the sales line because, well, with the extensions, uh, the extension on the extension on the extension, there are so many uh, parties that are involved in, in this sales line that sometimes you will get these errors. And that's one of the things that we need to consider when we start uh, making extensions. 
as I usually say, we are not alone and, uh, uh, anymore. I mean, we have uh, the, uh, uh, the base uh, triggers and the base properties, but we also have uh, the, the properties and the triggers of all the extensions that we need to handle. Um, then uh, later on, um, when I try to, to uh, change some of my primary keys, that was no good because uh, you cannot change a primary key in an extension because that is a schema change. So right now I have a, a number of tables in my extension uh, which uh, is not usable anymore. I had to make a copy of the, the, the table and put it into a, a new object uh, in order to get my, my new uh, primary key. Hopefully this will be uh, s uh, s solved at some point uh, but right now, it, is, it just looks a little bit strange in my, my database. So, um, how did it go? Well, actually it went well. Uh, it's, uh, it's a s nice small solution. Uh, I, I have a web shop, I have some subscription, I have some, some uh, but, but it's, it's fine. I have uh, right now two uh, uh, objects in the 5000 range. Um, actually, one of them has uh, disappeared again because the query for charts uh, in the CU3, uh, I think it was, uh, you couldn't have a, a query and use it in a chart. That was fixed later. So uh, that has been uh, disappeared now. But my code unit with .NET, yes, uh, I need that still. Now, uh, there's been some changes. So therefore, I'm going to uh, change this into uh, using the new uh, HTTP requests and, uh, and uh, response. And then I'm going to connect to a uh, API, instead of using the old .NET functionality, I can use the new functionality in the extensions. Um, now, there's also uh, some uh, customization in the standard objects. Uh, I don't know if uh, anyone has tried to make a uh, sales order in the 2018 from CU6 and forward. Well, if you go to a uh, a sales line and you type uh, a GL account and then you enter the account number. Then you enter the description. If you have a, an, a GL account with that description somewhere else, it will switch to that uh, account without telling you. Yeah, that's a nice one. Um, it's all it's actually the same in the, in the, in the, uh, in the purchase line. Uh, so I had to fix that. Uh, also in my, my in transfer orders, that's also a little. Uh, so, but that's uh, some of the small, um, uh, yeah, things that you 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 see when you uh, when when you go to the newest version. So, <coughs> one of the, well the tools that I used, uh, and as you can see, I have put them on my website, uh, so you can just download them. Uh, these are some uh, PowerShell scripts that I've been using, and they. Now, uh, Mark has, uh, has provided you with a conversion, but this nice little PowerShell script was my sword during the conversion, because whenever you need to, to convert from a, uh, a customized table up to a, uh, a um, extension table, uh, then you need to do a number of things. First of all, you need to uh, uh, enable the side-by-side -side development. Now, <coughs> the only way to, to uh, see the new objects is if you activate one extra setting in your service tier and you need to start up your, uh, your uh, development environment with a new parameter that's called genera generate symbol reference equals yes. Uh, and then it will, uh, uh, whenever you compile your objects, then they will be included in the symbol file that will be sent to your extension. Took me a while to find out that one because in the beginning, I, when I downloaded the symbols and then I just went in to, to see all my existing, I couldn't see all my existing customized tables. Uh, so second thing I had a problem with was the naming. Uh, that has been solved since because in the beginning uh, there was no talk about uh, uh, prefixes. So therefore I didn't prefix my table names. So instead what I did was I exported all my uh, my tables uh, with using this script uh, and um, uh, then I renamed all my tables in, in the seaside to something else 
Uh, and uh, then I uh, converted my, my objects into AL and imported them into the solution. Now, during that, now you said something about install code units. I made a quite a big install code unit. Then whenever you press uh, install on your uh, extension, then it will fire the install code unit. And that code unit uh, then carried all my data from my customized table and uh, into my extension. Uh, so, so this was the first of them, uh, and it's a nice little one. I know that um, Waldo is happy. He saw that I was going to, to uh, have a PowerShell script here, so that was a happy Waldo. Good. Uh, secondly, uh, handling the apps. Well, in, uh, in uh, NAV 2018 and in uh, Business Central on-premise, uh, you cannot upload your uh, extensions uh, to the cloud uh, or to, to, the, to the database. So therefore, you have to uh, either use your, uh, uh, your Visual Studio Code editor in order to, uh, to, to publish the uh, extension to the database, or you have to use a uh, PowerShell script. So what I did is uh, this PowerShell script uh, will show you the whole uh, the whole life cycle of an app. So in, uh, you can see in the, uh, in the top, I think I sh uh, the, uh, you start out by publishing it, you then you install it afterwards into the tenant. Uh, you uninstall this actually from my course uh, that I had yesterday. Uh, and um, uh, the strange thing, and that was a little surprise for me, uh, when you install an app, uh, first you publish it, then you install it to the tenant. Uh, and then you start using it. That's fine. Then you decide, nah, I don't want that. that not, no good. I'll, I'll take it away again. So you start out by, by uninstalling it. And then you go into the database and the, 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 everything is still there. The tables are still there. The data is still there. Then you unpublish it. The data is still there and the tables are still there. So what do we do then? Well, if you look at the last line down here, it's not until you run this sync command with the mode clean that it actually removes the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, actual table in the SQL server. Uh, and uh, that was a little bit of a surprise for me also because that means that if we don't watch out in the future, we'll have a hell of a cleaning up to do later on. Now the third tool I, um, I used was when I started doing these uh, uh, upgrades from one CE to CU to another one. Uh, because uh, then I found out, okay, it's not enough to upgrade your, uh, your database and your base application. You need also to upgrade all your, uh, your uh, extensions. And this is actually a nice little script uh, where you can uh, see that, uh, let me just here, we that, that is just redundant, but um, you uninstall the, the extension uh, and that is the old version of the extension. Then you publish the new version so that you have both versions side by side. Uh, then you have uh, this synchronization and then you start the uh, upgrade. And the upgrade is the upgrade code unit in the extension. Don't confuse the upgrade code units with the one in the uh, in C side because they have to be uh, executed uh, separately. Now. Um, I'm not quite sure what they're going to do in Business Central with the upgrade. Uh, because uh, I asked uh, a few Microsoft people yesterday, but I didn't get a clear answer on when the up, uh, upgrade code units are actually fired when you upgrade, uh, upload them to, to Business Central. So uh, we'll see. Uh, they said that they would run it periodically, but uh, I don't know. So. And uh, this has to be done for all your extensions. So therefore, my script at home is this long. I didn't want to bother you with the whole script. So uh, I'm I just gave you this uh, tiny little script. And it's actually based on the Danish uh, localization, uh, the one called Payment and Reconciliation Formats DK. But I'm sure that you can probably change that into something else. OK. then. Um, after a while, and actually, uh, luckily, a week after I had uh, made my upgrade, then uh, the CU3 came around. Uh, and uh, so whenever I, I get a new CU, 
It's the same procedure every time. Uh, I uninstall the whole uh, application, and then I install the new application next to it. Then I connect my, uh, my uh, development environment to my database, upgrade the database, load the, uh, uh, the upgrade uh, code units, run those, uh, and um, that's uh, more or less it. And then, of course, I take the new uh, objects there are and put them directly in. And since I don't have any changes in the standard application, except for a few error corrections that I have, uh, uh, that I've made, uh, then uh, one and a half hour for a whole uh, upgrade from uh, for both the, the base application for, for the uh, uh, code for everything. One and a half hour. Now, the CU9 was a, bit, a little bit uh, different because uh, I thought I could jump directly to uh, Dynamics 365 Business Central, but that did work, so I had to roll back, so therefore it took a little longer. So my issues are here that I need everything to be backward compatible. I cannot introduce something where I remove fields in the middle uh, of a, uh, in, in a table, uh, and um, uh, something about you can set it to be marked for deletion later on, but uh, that doesn't delete the actual field. Uh, so the other, the other thing I saw is that uh, in, in the different CUs, you get functionality chains, and some of those are ma maybe not even wanted. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the surprising ones that came in the CU6, uh, and that was the one I told you about with the, with the uh, uh, sales line, uh, and, um, uh, well, right until now, I can still go into Seaside and I can still go in and, and uh, say, all right, uh, we'll just uh, remark all this code and then I'm still running. But we won't be able to do, to do that in the, uh, in the future. So I would really like to see that the, the quality of the CU maybe is a little bit better or maybe that's a little harsh said, but maybe that... that uh, new functionality is based on setups instead of uh, being forced to the users. So, Mr. Mark. We are actually doing great on timing. It says here in the notes, 30 minutes, Mark starts. So we have to wait 12 seconds until oh I can start Okay, talking. you do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you want to uh, steal code, um, within our community, it's always been uh, good to get inspired by code from someone else. Yeah. Um, if you go to the uh, GitHub repository of uh, Fornav, you can go into the uh, uh, beta repository, and here you can download all of the code that I've created for Fornav. But I also got inspired by one of my good friends, Gunnar. If you go to uh, uh, Gunnar's uh, GitHub, you actually have to search a little bit, but then you can download his GL source names extension. Uh, the story behind that extension is a little bit funny because uh, I was in Iceland doing some consulting for quite a large ISV there who wanted to get his first steps on uh, extensions. And then Gunnar and I came up with the idea like, let's, let's see if we can blog about what it would make take to get your extension into uh, into app source and then I said oh my god I'm not going to do that it's my free time dude that's a lot of work but he actually took the challenge and uh, Gunnar actually blogged about uh, how to get into app source and I still think that uh, his blog is the best resource to get uh, inspiration on how to go to um, to app source so the back to the user cases um, another story that I want to tell you is uh, what we did at my largest customer. This customer is so close to me that it's even uh, strange to call it a customer. I've been working with these guys for 14 years now um, and internally at that company I am the uh, IT manager and the lead developer and we have a nav team of, uh, of four guys. Um, and I have a really close relationship with, um, with, with this customer. Uh, the existing situation that we have today is that we are running um, NAV 2017 and 2018. Our main database is on 2018. Uh, but we started with uh, Navision 3.70. That's what we went live on 14 uh, years ago. 
And every time a new version of NAV came out, uh, we evaluated and we decided if we wanted to upgrade or not. We have about 80 users in five different offices in different countries in, uh, in Europe. We have a base NAV installation with nine uh, companies and we have two add-ons which are uh, CFMD that we use as a base to code uh, against. And then we have added 1,800 objects. <coughs> yeah, that's a lot. Um, those 1,800 objects did not just show up like that. Um, it's an add-on that I wrote 20 years ago when I started my Navision career. Um, it's a trucking company and the add-on is for, uh, for managing uh, transportation companies. And slowly but surely, organically, over time, this solution grew. And I'll show you, show you a couple of slides of situations that we ran into when we converted a page to an extension that was converted from a form to a page, right? So um, it's conversion on, a on conversion on, on, on conversion. We also customized some stuff in NAV and based NAV. We, we I think we touched uh, about 100 objects. Um, and we have Power BI and we have direct SQL access. I'm heavily against hacking into SQL directly, but our CFO came to me and said, yeah, we are using ING Bank, and uh, ING promised me that they have this great tool where I can analyze the payment um, of, my, of my customers, and they are going to install, that, un install their tool on our Navision database. So the guy comes with his briefcase, but in the briefcase, there was no FOP. In the briefcase, there was a, a SQL statement. So ING is actually hacking on our database directly, and you just can't say no to the house bank, right? And then we have databases in uh, Romania, Lithuania, and Germany. They are actually the ones running on uh, 2017, partially. And they are base nav. They have no modifications. And I'll tell you how we integrated them, uh, because we actually used extensions to integrate those uh, databases together. Um, this is a fun company to work for. My commute is 22 minutes over country roads, right? And my daily driver is a Land Rover Defender and I have an American Ford pickup truck uh, for fun, right? So I cherish this customer a lot, no traffic. What is our long-term goal? Um, we basically want to migrate to Business Central, right? Um, both financial and operations. Uh, we want to have tenants for each country that we uh, work with. We want to have small extensions with customizations. We want to be uh, always current, and of course, we want to uh, be compliant with, uh, with GDPR. Uh, we have a lot of modules. I'm not going to uh, deeply go into all the modules, but we added a lot of functionality to NAV, and you can easily divide all of those um, things into modules. Everything is related to, uh, to trucking, of course. Um, and wouldn't it be nice if all of those modules could be their own uh, extensions, right? Um, yeah, we talked about that. We have about 75 interfaces. We heavily rely on .NET. We have 25 custom .NET uh, DLL files. The, the .NET was actually the one uh, that prevented us from completely going uh, to uh, extensions with NAV 2018. And we have added those 1,800 objects to, um, to NAV. The good news is that we have no dependency or almost no dependency whatsoever on base nav, right? but we do have a heavy dependency on, um, on .NET. So start small, right? Don't start big, start small. So the first try, the first extension that we did is I upgraded our database and I said, this is going to be the last merge ever. After this upgrade, I never have to merge code again. Um, we are running hybrid. So that means that uh, we have small extensions on top of our uh, Seaside system. And um, all of the fields that we added to tables are added to Seaside. Because from VS Code, you can code against Seaside. But from Seaside, it's very hard to code against an extension. But we, what we did do is we converted all of our changes to pages to uh, page extensions, right? So that was my first experience with extensions in real life. Um, so I created page 
Delta files based uh, with uh, with PowerShell, and I converted those pages to page extensions with uh, with the TXT to AL converter. That was way before uh, we had the uh, the four nav conversion tool. Um, another extension that I'll I'll show you in a minute is um, uh, we have the financial uh, systems in Romania and Lithuania and Germany. Our operations are run from uh, the Netherlands and we have to do invoicing in Romania. And what we did is um, we used the new API that Microsoft shipped last year um, in Business Central, but also in NAV 2018, there is a generic API that allows you to synchronize customers, vendors, and create sales invoices and purchase invoices. And what we did is we created an extension in our 2018 database that was calling the API in the Romanian database. And then in the Romanian database, we added an extension that would do some juggling with the data that we thought was necessary after the, um, uh, after the interface. And we also said everything that we are going to do from today forward, we're going to try to do as an extension. Um, it didn't mean that in the last 12 months I didn't touch Seaside. We still had a lot of little projects that had to be done in, uh, in Seaside, but we actually, I think we are currently working with about 12 extensions, right? So, um, so all the small stuff that we could make as an extension, we, uh, we did, right? So let's uh, see how that works. I'm going to go live into the customer system. Uh, the first thing I wanted to show you was uh, the option that Pike told you about. If you want to zoom it up again. How old do you think this audience is? <laughs> so you have to start up uh, the fin sql.exe with the uh, general symbol reference set to yes. And this will actually generate, if you make a change to one of the code units, it will actually generate the symbols at the, at the back end. Actually, the way that Microsoft is generating symbols is pretty smart. Um, you know that for each object that you have in Seaside, Microsoft generates a C-sharp file, which is basically the real code that is executed. And uh, uh, besides the C-sharp file, they also g generate behind the scenes a .al file. And what happens in, vis vis in VS Code, if you download symbols, basically what it does, it concatenates all the .al files that are stored in your database, and it wraps that into one big AL file, and it throws that into your extension as a symbol reference. Actually, the app file, th which is the symbol reference, is a zip file. You cannot open it with Windows, but if you download 7-zip, you can actually open it, and then you'll find a JSON file which is actually a humongous JSON file that contains all of the fields, tables, pages, and function names in your, in your database. Um, this is the uh, extension that we have created um, to communicate between the Romanian database and the um, uh, Dutch database. It uses the new options with the, uh, with the, with the, with the JSON um, objects. Uh, I think they are very powerful. It makes com communicating with uh, web services a lot easier. Um, this extension is not published on GitHub because um, it's a real project, it's a real customer, so we took a bunch of shortcuts. But if you are interested in this code, don't hesitate and just send me an email. I don't want to publish it on GitHub, but if you want to see it, just uh, send me an email. Uh, no secrets. Um, then we have the, uh, the page extensions. Here you can also see that I was juggling around a little bit with how do I call my objects. Um, I've been fighting Microsoft a little bit over um, the licensing. The situation we have today is um, with a customer license, you can run any page extension number for free. But with that customer license, you cannot publish a page extension unless you have that page ID in your license with the page designer, right? Fortunately, I also work for a partner, so I have a partner license that helps me publish the extension. Right, but um, even though the customer has application builder, and even though the customer's runtime allows them to run any page extension, 
um, I still couldn't publish this with, uh, with, a, with a customer, uh, customer license. And just to quickly illustrate to you how small an extension can be, we are a trucking company and we still rely on phones. Uh, we do a lot of subcontracting, a lot of subcontractors are small, single truck companies, freelancers. Um, and we just call them up and say, do you have time for some freight tomorrow? And all the planners don't have those numbers in their head. So they had the numbers of, the, of, the, of those uh, subcontractors in, in a phone, in a phone system, and that phone system died. So we got a new voice over IP system, and with that VoIP system, we could actually create an interface between uh, NAV and that uh, VoIP system. And this is the interface, right? Super complicated interface, right? You just install a tool on your terminal server and then it works. If you ask the guys what was the best improvement that we made to Navision in the last 12 months, everybody unanimously say, oh, that we can call from Navision, right? That was just the best thing you did last year, right? But this is how small an extension can be because now I can go to another customer and do this extension again, and again, and again. And I don't have to say, which customer did I do that for, and which objects do I have to filter on, and fil export it to a FOB file, and it's just get, get, uh, get cumbersome, right? Next step, Business Central. That's the next step we want to do. We want to do 100% extensions on-premises with .NET. After that, we want to go to Azure Functions, but let's take small steps at a time. Um, some general tips, uh, use an Excel sheet for object numbers. We actually have an Excel sheet. I can show the Excel sheet right here. This is just a simple Excel sheet that uh, tells me which objects are in which extension. Um, use the date in your versioning. This is also a nice uh, trick, but in your uh, object version, if I go to my extension, I can actually see the last date that I've been working on this extension, right? Even though I have Git integration, uh, this is very easy to, uh, to have in your uh, versioning. Um, I'm using PowerShell to, uh, to deploy because at the trucking company, we still use the Windows client. Um, the Windows debugger still works fine. With the Windows debugger, you can actually debug extensions but you have to turn on the show my code property, right? By default, Microsoft switches off the show my code, which means that if you publish your extension, the source code is not there. And then if you have to debug a problem in life or in a yesterday database, you cannot uh, run the debugger. So how did we convert? We ran the um, 4NAV converter and we exported all of our uh, objects from uh, Seaside and voila, we have an extension with uh, table extensions, page extensions, etc. cetera. Um, after the conversion, I went back and I fixed stupid errors. And let me go through the slides. What do you think is wrong with this code, right? This code compiles just fine in Seaside. But after the conversion to an extension, this showed up. This is hard to see for the human eye, right? There's two case statements being catched. And of course, only the first one will, uh, will win. Um, and as long as no, none of the users are complaining, then, then this, this just works. What's wrong with this code? The from address depot used to be an option field, and I changed it to a Boolean. That's what you can do if you code for one customer, right? Extensions don't like that, right? Extensions think that this should not compile, even though it works just fine in, uh, in Seaside. Uh, format address. Um, in extensions, you cannot add functions to this code unit anymore. Uh, so instead of adding functions to the code unit, you have to add a function to the table. And in your table, you can run the, the format address function. Uh, the same with dimension management. Um, I've added a couple of functions for, uh, for doing funky stuff with dimensions, um, and I've created my own dimension management code unit. 
This is the example that I talked about with the uh, form to page transformation tool. We have a whole bunch of forms that we just converted to a page. Does it look well? Yeah, it looks well. Okay, let's just go live, right? I'm not going to check uh, four, five, six hundred pages. So after the conversion, we ran into code like this that uh, in the first version of the roll the client, there was no on after get cur record. So the form transformation tool would actually generate this on after get cur record. And then um, in, in VS Code, you would get the, uh, the warning, right? Table extensions and local variables. Um, if you get your table extension, it doesn't necessarily compile. Um, if you have a function in a table extension and that function depends on a global variable, the global variable is, is, is dead, right? The global, global variable doesn't work anymore. So sometimes you have to refactor some code in order for the, uh, for the function to work again. I actually tried to fix all of this in uh, Seaside and then run the conversion uh, again. But in some cases, you end up creating local variables and global variables with the same name and then just relying on the fact that Seaside knows that the local variable is more important than the, than the global variable because that's what uh, table extensions do as well. Um, when we created the add-on 20 years ago, we didn't have service items, so we created our own types in the sales line. You cannot add types in the sales line with extensions, even though Microsoft introduced the enum type. They did not implement the enum in the sales line, so you still cannot add types to the sales line. So we just decided to convert back to service items, right? That didn't exist 20 years ago, and we said, okay, let's just throw away our own uh, service items, and let's use the Microsoft ones. We are running short on time, and I want to give you guys an opportunity to ask questions, but I just want to quickly show you the uh, monolith extension with um, 2,000 objects, right? It works. I have an extension with 2,000 objects. If I start Visual Studio Code, it takes about 90 seconds and after 90 seconds, it actually figures out that my extension has 164 warnings. If I now start typing, it'll take a while for a Visual Studio Code compiler to catch up with my typing because the compiler has to constantly look at all of the objects in my extension. If I build it, and let's force the demo gods, it should build in about um, 30 seconds and then I can uh, deploy it. Why am I telling you this? Um, I think it's important still, even if this works, to break your extensions up into smaller modules, right? Uh, Seaside had runtime compiling, right? In Seaside, you could throw away a function, and then at runtime, you would figure out that that function did not exist anymore. In Visual Studio Code, you can't do that anymore. In Visual Studio Code, if you delete a function, the compiler will immediately start searching where that function is used. And it's just a lot easier if you start refactoring your code and work with smaller extensions. Make sure that your smallest extensions that everything else depends on doesn't change very often. Because if you change an extension that other extensions depend on, you have to uninstall all of your depending extensions, right? And you don't want to spend every Sunday hours and hours of doing PowerShell scripts in order to make that work. This is proof that it works. It's ugly, but it works. Breaking up your extension, uh, we rely on Anveo and Fornav, which are now extensions, and are... Yeah, I need to speed up. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. So key, key takeaways, stay away of base code, uh, start cleaning up in Seaside, try to delete objects, see what happens, take incremental steps, but real steps. And it's just fun to do, really. I mean, it, it works. Um, be careful with these guys. I mean, we are lucky that we don't touch base nav, but um, these are still uh, uh, application areas that um, uh, you have to be careful with. Uh, what happens if you de delete fixed assets, right? In Seaside, you can filter on all of the fixed asset objects and say, okay, I want to delete them. But then CodeUnit 80 doesn't compile anymore. So I'm not jealous at the guys of Microsoft who are going to break um, the, uh, the base app into mul multiple modules. Core nav is not decoupled. 
we still think it was great, and a lot of code that we write is still not decoupled, right? Before we go into Q&A, I want to give, send you away with a thought. What if we had Seaside like this three years ago? What if a table extension and a page extension were an object type in Seaside? My guess would be that the adoption rate of extensions would have been higher, because then we could create extensions in an environment that we are familiar with, and then from the familiar environment, then go to VS Code, right? Questions? Yeah? I was told to tell you that the black part is actually the part that you have to talk into. Uh, what is about the menu suite? What is about the menu suite? So the menu suite does not exist anymore, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, the menu suite is replaced with a new property. Called usage category. Yeah, called usage category. And you cannot make groups in the in the menu suite anymore. You can only make categories. That's why the name is like that. Catch. Any other questions? Yeah, this is where the users category goes. And basically what we do with the 4.5 converter is we look at the menu suite, and if the report was in the menu suite, we automatically generate this property, right? So that makes life easier. And this is only for, uh, for pages, and it's for reports uh, that you can uh, put the usage category. Next one. Oh, almost. Almost. <laughs> what are your experiences with um, upgrading an existing um, extension by in a live database? I'm taking shortcuts, right? So um, this is a one-off customer, and these extensions are not in app source. So if I upgrade an extension, I write SQL scripts. I don't create upgrade code units. I create code, uh, upgrade yeah. code units. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it, it doesn't work. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But, and if you have like a lot of like item ledger entries, for example, does it take a long time? Does it have everybody to stop working and every for every extension or just the ones using that actual ex extension? So we don't <coughs> use item ledger entries. We are a trucker company. We yeah. don't have inventory. So that's why we are on the happy path, right? Um, I can tell you what does not work, but that would be a very boring 90 minutes. I wanted <laughs> to tell you what works <laughs> and what actually was happy. But we do have one table that has 2.3 million rows, which is our shipment table. It contains all of the shipments from the last 14 years. Um, and we added table extensions to those uh, tables. And the performance of adding those table extensions is the same as adding it using Seaside. It's exactly the same. And we didn't see any drawbacks of the companion tables. The companion tables, I mean, if I look at our SQL server, the SQL server that we have spends twice as much time writing as reading. And our service tier has 100 gigs of RAM. And if I look at all of our data is in, we have a 200 gig database, and all of our, our data is in, in memory, right? So our SQL server is basically eating out of its nose all the time. Catch. Oh, you can give it to your... Uh, from a personal perspective, uh, if you have the choice to start with SNAF 2018, with AL or Hybrid or Seaside, what would you do? First of all, if you, there are still scenarios that won't work, right? If you are doing heavy crunching on reservation entries, it doesn't work, right? But if you have a scenario where you can run with extensions, I would run with extensions and maybe do something 
in um, in in Seaside to make it uh, to make it work. So like what what Pike basically did is create one code unit with .NET because .NET is not supported. Uh, but what we do in the, in, in, in at the trucking company is with each request we say okay which route do we take and uh, extensions is the preferred uh, route. Um, one of the things that makes me worried personally is that uh, the promise that Microsoft did is we will never break your extensions. And the first fracking release, <laughs> they r remove code unit one and <laughs> everything is broken, <laughs> right? <laughs> and now they are going to say that they're going to refactor base nav. So that's something that I'm worried about. So what will happen in the future releases and how much AL do I have to refactor? But will that be better if I stay in Seaside? Definitely not, right? No. We have another question over here. <laughs> you really want to have me? <laughs> no, never mind. Uh, upgrading from 2013 to 2018, uh, do we have to go to 2018 CU4? Because only there we had these upgrade uh, code units. In the later, there is missing that upgrade code unit. No, you have to go to the, I, I would go to the latest uh, version of, uh, of uh, 2018. And use yeah. the code unit from the 2018 CU4. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to give a shout out to Microsoft because at the trucking company, we are working with 2018 RTM and we have not implemented a single cumulative update. Everything that we did with extensions was on 2018 RTM, right? It was a very stable release from our perspective. Um, <laughs> you said you couldn't uh, no comment. <laughs> upgrade the <laughs> extension uh, because it didn't have the ID in the customer license. Uh, yeah. But can't you create a runtime package and then install it with the customer license? Yes, you can create a runtime package, but generating the runtime package requires the partner license. Ah, okay. It's a catch-22 story. <laughs> it's horrible. Yeah. Right, I think we are um, almost out of time. We have yeah, one we have one minute left, so let's just continue. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, when you migrate uh, to the cloud, how do you um, migrate the data? Uh, just by rapid start? Or just by rapid start. I've been told that uh, the, uh, the, 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 the tool that Microsoft has created for the intelligent cloud the replication. That's, that's going to be the future tool that you are going to use to convert your customers to Business Central. So okay. if you have an on-prem database yeah. and in Business Central the schemas are identical, mm -hmm. you can use that tool to convert uh, an, an on-prem NAV system or an on-prem GP system. Okay, that would be perfect, <laughs> I yeah. guess. So I have a um, question over here, higher in the public. Okay, I have no idea where you are. But <laughs> <laughs> here. <laughs> Uh, here. That's okay, just talk. Um, my question is what is the best way to create an uh, Xlify file for extension? Um, you want to take that, Mike? Or? Yeah, you can, you can do it uh, two ways. Either the, you can have it uh, generated automatically. You can, uh, there is a conversion tool where you can export the module uh, from uh, Seaside into this uh, export translation. And then there is a conversion from the text file to the uh, XLIF file. Or you can just uh, use the, uh, the export uh, to new syntax that will include the XLIF file automatically. If it is a new extension which is um, built on AL, it's not, it's not in CL. No. Okay. Then uh, that's only hard work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> We are on spare time, so thank you for attending and see you thank hopefully you. next year.